Good morning, everybody. We will make a start because our time together is quite short. We have our lunch break coming up about 10 past 12. So hopefully you found your way uh, to the right space. I guess you had the easier job because we were just here for this um, workshop on shame and identity in body dysmorphic disorder. And my aim is to talk for a little while and then we'll see how we go with time and hopefully have a little bit of time for questions and reflections at the end. So I should introduce myself. My name is um, Dr. Nicole Schnackenberg. I work for the Educational Psychology Service in Southend. I'm also a trustee of the Body Dysmorphic Disorder Foundation and have lived experience as well. So what I'm hoping that we'll cover is what shame actually is. So I think often kind of the term shame is banded around or people experience shame. But what, what is that actually? What does it look like? What does it feel like and what does it mean, particularly in the context of body dysmorphic disorder? How it relates to the nervous system and the brain, because I think that's really important. It's an embodied experience, so we need to consider that. Um, oh, there's little screens down there. That's handy. Um, the sense of identity in BDD and how it connects with shame. So how an experience of shame can impact on our sense of identity. And also then a little model that I developed as part of my doctoral research, namely the shame identity model of, of BDD. And it's a little bit like this. Um, thinking of one of Escher's uh, drawings, the sense of shame and identity really feeding into one another and becoming essentially a self-amplifying cycle, which I hope I shall um, make a bit more sense of as we move through this, this section together. Okay, so what is shame? So shame, before we think about what it is, let's think about when, to, when it develops. So it develops developmentally before guilt develops. And guilt and shame are very, very different. So guilt is the sense of, I have done something bad, actually. And with that comes the sense of, I can do something about that. Because if I've done something bad, well, maybe I can say sorry for it, or make amends in some way, maybe I can do things differently the next time. So there's some kind of hope that comes with guilt, in a sense. Shame is completely different, because shame is the sense of, not I have done something bad, but I am bad. And that's completely different. A sense that I am bad at the very core of myself. And it's my personal lived experience, but also my experience of working and, and researching uh, body dysmorphic disorder, that this sense of shame is absolutely an underpinning foundational factor. This sense of there's something about me that's bad and wrong, and I don't know what to do with that, actually. And with guilt, I've got an idea of what I can do with it, but if I'm bad through and through, or if there's something intrinsically wrong with me, where do I go with that? What do I do with that? And it's my understanding that in the context of BDD, what's kind of done with that is that it's projected or pinned onto the perceived appearance defect with the hope that once that perceived de defect is fixed, the sense of shame will be removed. And that's only part of the story, of course it is, but I believe it's quite an important part of the story. And we'll talk about that more as we go along. But hopefully it's making some sense um, just to start us off. So shame first emerges when the infant becomes ambulatory, so when the infant begins to move away from the caregiver and come back to the caregiver. And this is really interesting. So there's a sense of the infant goes off and explores the world, and maybe it's better to work with an example. So let's say um, the infant is with the caregiver in the garden, and they crawl off to go and explore a little bit because they're still doing that thing where they go off and they come back and they go off and they come back. And in their little experience of exploring, maybe they find some mud. Oh, it's so exciting. Um, and they squeeze it in their little hands and they put it on their face. And oh, it feels so good and it's such a pleasurable experience. And the infant has taken themselves into a joy state. And I guess the reason I do that with my hand when I say that is because it's a sympathetically driven state. So if we think about the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, we have two branches, don't we? We have that sympathetic, that energy mobilising, which sometimes gets called the fight, flight, freeze and fawn, but it's more than that. 
And then we have that parasympathetic, which is our rest and digest, the energy conserving part. But what happens in shame is the infant goes off, the, in the early experiences of shame, the infant goes off, it has an exciting experience, so they're in an energy mobilized, sympathetically driven state, and then they come back to the caregiver, oh, you know, really excited and expecting that excitement to be mirrored in the caregiver's gaze. And as we'll come to think about, shame more than any other emotion is a visual emotion. Now, isn't that interesting? If we're thinking about BDD being a visually driven experience, then how fascinating that shame is the emotion that's held up as being a visual emotion. So the infant comes back and expects that kind of reciprocated joy, and for perfectly legitimate reasons, perhaps it doesn't receive it. You know, perhaps there's a bit of shock. Oh my goodness, what's that on your face? Or perhaps a little bit of disgust or um, just confusion. Like, hey, you were here a second ago and what happened? Um, and that causes, if you like, or that can lead to a sense of withdrawal, a sense of, hey, we're not connected anymore. My internal experience of excitement isn't your internal experience of excitement. And therefore, I, I really understand deep in my heart that we are separate. And it's that early learning of separation, really, that's part of the experience of shame. Of course, as we grow older, it, it, it manifests in different ways, but developmental psychologists have found this is characteristic of that early experience of shame. And Daniel Stern, who's a developmental psychologist, talks about it as a decrescendo. So a, a drop from an energy-mobilized, sympathetically driven, joy state straight down to an energy conserving parasympathetically driven withdrawal state shame is a withdrawal and you'll hear people say things like oh, i wish the floor would swallow me up or i could disappear that's that sense of retraction um, and so that developmentally comes before guilt so the guilt comes later about 36 months and actually shame's a lot more pervasive and a lot more difficult to move beyond because it, it goes so deep it, it goes to this part of ourselves that actually is not quite sure or is ambivalent about whether we want to separate from others or not because more than any other emotion it tells us you are not me and I am not you because we're having such a different experience and there's this idea that shame burns and gates um, guilt beg your pardon weighs so we kind of feel weighed down by guilt, and that can feel hev heavy and burdensome, but guilt, kind of almost uh, shame, burns us from the inside out. And that's where we get this sense of blushing as well, you know, the cheeks burning. And people often say to me when I talk about shame, but it, surely the cheeks are more of a sympathetically sort of fight or flight experience, but it's not. The flushing of the cheeks is actually driven by the shock of that decrescendo, of dropping from a joy state to a state of withdrawal, and so the cheeks burn. And it's been described by Alan Shaw as a sense of worthlessness and smallness, and I'm sure some of us can resonate with that. So, okay, so it's been described as an attachment emotion because it's a social emotion. It happens initially in relation with others. So early experiences of shame happen in relation to others, and they're perfectly, in inverted commas, normal and legitimate. And we'll see why. Because all human emotions have a, a positive um, reason for their existence. Why would they be there otherwise? It's also been described, as I said, as a visual emotion. So that there's also talk about how shame is in the gaze and guilt is in the voice. So the shame is the internalized gaze of the other and guilt is the internalized voice of the other. And as the incorporated gaze of the other. So there's this sense of, in the experience of shame, because it's such a visual experience, it's like I'm caught in the gaze of the other. There's a sense of, I no longer... Or there's a split, I should say, a split between I am a body and I have a body. That's confusing, isn't it? Am I a body or do I have the body? And if I, if I have the body, the body becomes an object, and it's that objectification of the body that leads us to think, well, I can therefore do something, something to manipulate it, and in the context of BDD, therefore, something to fix it. 
Of course, shame is hidden by its very nature. It is a withdrawal, it is a retraction, it is a sense of hiding and concealment. And as I explained, it's that kind of dip that happens. In BDD, it would appear that the shame becomes internalized, not only in BDD, but I guess that's what we're talking about this morning, um, that it becomes internalized. So what initially happened intra intrapersonally, so between people, now happens interpersonally. So now I'm kind of fueling my own shame state. So it's not, it, it, it leaps from being about how the other sees and perceives me to being how I see and perceive myself. I internalise that sense of persecution, if you like, or felt persecution of the gaze. And now I persecute myself with my own gaze, actually. And this is accompanied by that discrepancy between how I perceive myself to look and how I perceive myself to be. Remember, shame is this felt sense of the bad self and how I believe I should look or my ideal, idealised self. And as I think, I think it was a me to mention this morning, if that gap between my um, shameful bad self and my idealised good self is huge then I, I might feel very hopeless and helpless because how on earth am I supposed to um, kind of move beyond my experience? And as I explained at the beginning, and I'll keep repeating because I think it's worth repeating, in the experience of BDD, it feels like the thing that's grasped onto is the hope that fixing the perceived appearance defect will remove the sense of shame and lead the person to feel lovable, safe and good. And in this way, you might conceive BDD not so much as a self-destructive act, but as an act of hope, actually. Because there's, there's the desire that if I just fix this body part, everything's going to be okay. I'm going to be lovable, and that seems to be the key element here. The sense of shame appears to be driven by an absolute terror that the self might be unlovable and therefore might be rejectable. And that's just um, too much to bear. Okay. So I just think this quote is really powerful, so I put it up. And I know you can read for yourselves, but I'll read it because it's perhaps powerful to hear it as well. Um, if I see another person, I perceive her essentially in her gaze, which is directed towards objects like a ray. I see her as the centre of a gaze. Now... If this roaming gaze turns on me, I am suddenly caught, as it were, in a force field, in a suction that attracts me, or in a stream that floods me. I am torn out of the centrality of my lived body and become an object inside another world. The other's gaze decentralizes my world. And I find this so powerful because I can actually feel it in my body and resonate with that experience. I've had that experience where I feel caught in the gaze of others or others and I feel myself an object. And in that moment, an object actually I'd like to obliterate because it feels so detestable. And the face is an interesting thing and Thomas Fuchs speaks about this and it's interesting that it's often one of the core foci of appearance um, supposed appearance defects in body dysmorphic disorder because it's actually a blind spot for us. We cannot see our own faces, only through the mirror. And mirrors are a fairly recent invention in the history of humankind. We can see our hands, we can see the rest of our body. It's only the other, particularly in moments where we feel caught in that gaze, they have access to something we don't have access to. And this can lead us to almost try and put ourselves in the position of the other in order to try and get into their mind and understand how they are perceiving us. And um, this is complicated. This is complicated. And we might make all sorts of suppositions about what we think is seen um, that might be very different to what is actually seen. And Thomas Fuchs also speaks about the blushing as like the burning rays of the other. Interesting that that also therefore happens on the face. So I hope this is making some kind of sense. Uh, so what is the purpose of shame? So it, as I said, all human emotions have um, a function. Of course they do, otherwise why would they exist? 
So it seems to be that the function of shame, well, it has many. One is that it's a modulator of that hyper-aroused state. So, you know, when that infant and later adult goes into that state of really strong hyper-arousal and excitement, it somehow brings it down a little bit, those small doses of shame. It's also very important in regards to a reflective knowing about ourselves. So, to kind of have that perception of ourselves from the other's perspective. And therefore, it's important for what's called the theory of mind. The sense that you and I have different minds and we have different thoughts and we have different feelings. Nothing communicates that as strongly and as viscerally as an experience of shame. And for that reason, it's really important to the individuation process. So we start our lives as infants and we feel completely um, connected and at one with our caregivers. And over time, we learn to separate and individuate. We learn, hey, these are my edges. I am a separate person. I have separate feelings and thoughts, separate needs and desires. In order for that individuation process to happen, we need to feel it. And in no emotion do we feel it more strongly than in shame. So... In small, um, unavoidable doses, it's totally useful, actually, and totally adaptive. It helps us to um, separate, it helps us to individuate, and it increases our sense of autonomy. It's part of the separation individuation process. However, um, there is a huge difference between shame that is regulated and shame that isn't regulated. And it's repeated, unregulated, or dysregulated experiences of shame that appear to lead to this sense of the self as the bad self. So it's not, we, we, we can't say, oh, because I've had experiences of shame, I'm, I'm led to feel like the bad self, because it may be that those experiences of shame have been very much regulated, but rather when we're left with it repeatedly. And what I mean by that is, so if we think back to our example, you know, perhaps the infant comes back and, you know, there's that bit of shock, totally understandably so, you know, what on earth have you got on your face? And then the caregiver notices that withdrawal of the infant, maybe notices the blushing or notices the sense of shame comes with a collapse often, this kind of um, collapsing into oneself. And then modulates and re regulates that shame. Oh, it's okay. You know, maybe sings a lullaby or a, a nursery rhyme whilst wiping off the dirt from the face, and it's regulated. And it's not just in, that's just in early experiences of shame. Experiences of shame are not necessarily occurring in the caregiver relationship. It might be occurring in, in the uh, context of bullying, which um, Professor Veal was going to speak about later. So in the experience of bullying, shame is rarely regulated, actually. You know, it's rarely the case that the bully comes up to me later and says, oh, you know, I'm really sorry, Nicole, um, that I pushed you over. You know, often, it, often it's more the case that the next day they push me over again if we're having those repeated experiences of shame. But also there's something about personality aspects. So if I'm particularly sensitive to those experiences, even one experience of shame, an isolated experience that perhaps by another might be brushed off, even though it isn't modulated or regulated, actually exists as a flashbulb memory in my mind. It's like a chock, and it's so strong, and I felt it so deeply that I struggle to move beyond it, and it somehow takes root in my sense of self. And this is where it's related to identity. Because if I've got an identity of myself as a shameful self and a bad self, then that's not a very robust um, self-esteem and self-concept that I'm, I'm living with. Okay. Okay, so we've mentioned what it represents physiologically. And because we have that decrescendo, so we're moving into the parasympathetically driven state with um, shame, the heart rate slows down. And this is important because when, with the heart rate slowing down, so time feels like it's slowing down. So what might be taking place in, in a few moments actually feels like a longer stretch of time. So it's almost like that shame experience becomes drawn out and therefore can feel like a stronger experience in memory, whether that's our concrete memory, our verbalised memory, or our more implicit memory, than it actually was. And in the literature, it talks about two kinds of disintegration that can happen as a result. So this sense of a fragmented self, so the sense that the self's in pieces, 
Um, and this is something I hear very commonly or often when I speak with people that struggle with body dysmorphic disorder. They just feel like they, they've, they, there's, they're in parts somehow and they can't quite feel themselves as an integrated whole. Um, but also this sense of a depleted self, this sense of in that parasympathetically driven withdrawal state, I don't have the energy um, to kind of lift myself out of the experience. And this is what can make it very hard to access things like treatment because I just don't have the energy for that because I'm in that withdrawals, withdrawal state. And this is all related to the window of tolerance. I will be talking about this a little bit or in a lot more depth this afternoon um, for the eating disorder workshop. It's also relevant to body dysmorphic disorder. You may have seen this model, but there's a sense of in between that hyperaroused state, that state of kind of um, positive hedonistic joy state, let's say, but also that energy mobilized state that can also um, be characterized by anxiety. And that hyperaroused, underaroused state, parasympathetically driven, characterized by de depression, there's a window of tolerance in the middle. And that can be thinner or wider depending on our experiences. And shame takes us outside of the window of tolerance. We, we're, we're, we're over the top of it with excitement and then we're crashing down to this part at the bottom. And because we're not in our window of tolerance, it's difficult for us to think and feel at the same time. And therefore it's difficult to um, reflect with kind of the prefrontal cortex, the, the thinking part of our brain about that shame experience. So it might be that kind of the logical part of ourselves knows that's over. Um, and that shaming experience, whether it be bullying or something else happening within relationships um, that has caused an experience of shame, because it always begins relationally and is then internalised, is over, but the nervous system doesn't know it's over. So it's still doing these decrescendos and we still feel stuck in that experience of shame. And that perhaps leads us to the mirror or to picking the skin or to going online and researching cosmetic surgery, dentistry, dentistry, dermatology, in a desperate bid to do something about how we feel and to bring ourselves back into our window of tolerance. Okay, so we're going to skip through these bits and I'll get onto the model. So there's something about shame that is um, related to constant self-monitoring which is interesting, isn't it, given the experience of body dysmorphic disorder and how it can feel like we're just constantly monitoring how we think we look, how we think we're being perceived, where we are and where we'd like to be. Um, and it, it can happen in all sorts of ways. It could be a loss of feedback from others or it could be a break in relationship. Again, leading to that sense of a divided sense of self. So thinking about it as an implosion, really. Um, and these things are really important. So it tends to occur when our need for soul connection isn't met. So we find ourselves abandoned with our feelings. You know, thinking back to that infant, suddenly they, they feel totally alone in how they feel because the other is feeling completely different to how they are feeling, and it's so obvious. Um, and this can lead to compulsive self-observation. And I spoke about that, so we become not only the observer, but also the observed. We take two positions. So we take two positions with the body. I am a body and I have a body. And we also take two positions in I am the observer and I am the observed. And in that way, we internalize the experience and we perpetuate it without any shame experiences needing to happen in our environment. So we're doing it all very well by ourselves. Thank you very much. Um, and in bold, and I think I put it in bold because I find this really important, that it's a signal that the deeper self, um, it's a, a signal from the deeper self, from our true self, that that individuation and self-expression are blocked. What that means is, if we turn it on our head, that in order to move beyond an experience or a pervasive felt sense of shame, a pervasive self, a sense of badness of the self, we need to complete that process of individuation. We need to find our own edges and find our own personhood. And Hannah Lewis spoke about that beautifully this morning, sort of coming into who she really is, unabashedly, and with, with um, joy, um, and also that self-expression that goes along with it. If we are stuck in a feeling of shame, if we're stuck in a felt sense of our own badness, then actually these aspects are probably begging, absolutely begging, for our attention 
and begging to be lived out. It's like they're knocking on our door and saying, hey, I want you to be this separate, individuated person who's living their life from their true self, and you're not. So I'm going to keep almost reminding you of this felt sense of badness so you do something about it. The tricky thing is, in BDD, what we do about it is, is that we project it onto a perceived defect, and that doesn't work, as we know, and as I'll hopefully elucidate a bit more. So I won't read this quote. I'll just leave it up for you to have a quick look at. It's a quote I did use in my doctoral research because I felt it encapsulated what I'd found from speaking to... It was just a small sample, 10 young people um, with lived experience of body dysmorphic disorder, but also using those conversations I had with those young people and going back into the research and thinking about how those aspects interlinked. And, of course, not... Um, separating myself from that. As someone with lived experience, I'm going to come with my own lens and my own perceptions, and that absolutely fed into um, this model as well. Okay, so this is the model, and it is particularly um, around young people, but I do believe it, it would um, make sense at any age and stage. We just think about this education bit as perhaps being more work-related or other related. And I'm absolutely not saying this is everyone's experience of BDD. I'm saying this seems to be one possible way it might play itself out. And I'm going to go through it um, and hopefully make a bit more sense of it uh, before we take some comments and questions. And the title of my research was The Only Way I Was Going to Be Lovable, and it came from this quote. And for me, this, this is the core of BDD. The core felt sense that I am not lovable as I am, and that I therefore need to do something about it. And what I need to do about it is fix my appearance, because that's the thing that's going to make me lovable. That's the thing that's going to negate rejection. That's the thing that's going to make me feel safe. Okay. So let's go through the first part then. So you can see shame in the middle there, and underneath shame it seems to be um, related to some kind of experience, uh, relational experience. That relational experience might be remembered, so the person might be able to sit down and say, when I was nine years old I was in the playground and this bunch of kids came up and they stole my hat and you know, I felt so ashamed and and that be kind of concrete, or it might be just this felt sense of, I don't know why, but I just feel bad inside. I just feel worthless. I feel not good enough. That phrase comes up again and again. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. And somehow this feeling of not good enoughness, that for whatever reason emerged, and we're never pointing the finger of blame, because it's never one incident, one person, one experience. It's a lot more complex than that. And the person's sensitivity factors will play into it also somehow lead to this felt sense of shame, this sense of not guilt, I have done something bad, but rather I am bad at my core. And again, Hannah spoke about this morning, about that this morning, always thinking, well, perhaps I was born by artificial means because this, surely I can't be a human being. And that again, I hear all the time, I'm a monster, I'm a parasite. Um, somehow I'm not quite like the rest of humanity are. And this relates to low self-worth, of course it does, but also relates to that person's felt sense of identity. So the identity as the self, as the, ba um, as the bad self. And these, the arrows go both ways, you can see, because it really, one relates to the other. And as Amita said this morning, isn't it interesting that BDD most commonly emerges around sort of those early teenage years, when we are beginning to really grapple with the sense of um, individuation and separation versus attachment and connection. You know, we're beginning to separate out from the primary caregivers and we want that independence, part of us does, but the other part is absolutely terrified and wants to remain connected. And it seems to be at this point in particular that tremendous tension between the attached drive and the, the detached drive um, that BDD particularly emerges. So within the context of identity formation in adolescence seems to be part of it. And then we move up. So I'm having this feeling of shame. I feel like I am bad, and I don't know what to do about it. 
Now let's imagine that I, I truly believe I'm a bad person and I believe there's nothing I can do about it, or even a bad object. Some people can't even bear to think of themselves or don't see themselves as a person as I previously described. So I'm this bad thing and there's nothing I can do about it. Well, that leads to hopelessness, that leads to helplessness, and that can lead to actually suicidality because I can't do anything about um, how I'm feeling and how I am. I am definitely going to be rejected and I'm definitely unlovable and that's it, full stop, thank you very much. But we're very clever as human beings, we're very clever and we have to really congratulate ourselves for how, how adaptive we are. We won't let that happen, no, thank you very much. Instead, I'm going to find something to project and pin that felt sense of shame onto, the felt sense of badness onto. And by doing that, I give myself an opportunity to fix it, and I offer myself hope. And that's what I mean when I talk about BDD rather being initially an act of hope. Even if it really takes hold of that person, and in the end, they're really struggling to desire to live, what ends up as a lack of desire to live started as an act of hope. And I think it's really important to remember that. And to, for those that are treating BDD to consider it in our treatment as well. So this felt sense of shame is projected or pinned onto the perceived appearance defect with the desperate hope that if I just fix my nose, if I just clean up my skin, if I just um, have my ears pinned back, if I just lose the weight, I'm going to feel safe. I'm not going to feel like this bad object anymore, and I'm going to be lovable. And therefore, I have a possibility at a life. And it's held on to very tightly. And again, this is why we've got to be very careful if we are supporting people with BDD, whether as family members, friends, or as clinicians, that we're not just going in and instantly saying, you've got to drop all of that. Because if that's the only thing you're holding on to for hope, that's devastating, actually. And I've seen people's faces, and I've experienced it myself, this idea that if that isn't the case, if it isn't true, then what am I left with? I'm left with this felt sense of badness of the self, and I can't bear it, actually. And we can think about the safety behaviours almost as being kind of transitional objects. So Donald Winnicott, um, who was a... What was he? He was a paediatrician. I think he was also a psychoanalyst. He spoke about how infants, if you watch an infant, when they begin to individuate from their caregivers and separate from their caregivers, they often take an object to support them. So for me, it was Nelly the elephant. Um, for some people, it's a dummy, a blanket. But that, for me, so Nelly the elephant was the thing I soothed myself with when I was away with my, from my mother. So. I was kind of trying to internalise that ability to soothe myself, but I hadn't quite got it yet, so I needed Nelly the Elephant to do it for me. And then once I was able to do it for myself, I didn't need Nelly the Elephant or, or the dummy anymore. And in a similar way, the safety behaviours kind of do that. So with a sense of transitioning from the bad sense of self to the hopefully good sense of self or the, or the desired good sense of self. So I'm, I'm feeling... Um, this deep sense of shame, I don't know what to do with it, but I've given myself a very clever equation. I've told myself, ah, oh, well, if I fix my nose, then it will be removed. But in that moment of that desperation, I still need to do something to move towards that goal. So I go to my safety behavior. Maybe I touch and check my nose. Maybe I check it in the mirror. Maybe I, um, thinking of Tanya Gooding's speech this morning, I scroll on the phone looking at the nearest cosmetic surgeons to where I live. And in that moment, in that action, I'm kind of soothing myself or attempting to soothe myself. So they're a bit like those transitional objects that Donald Winnicott spoke about. And leading to this top part, as you see there, this belief that once I fix the nose or whatever it is, I will be lovable, safe and whole. The difficulty is, and um, of course, it makes sense that it's a difficulty because how are we going to fix something that's psychological and emotional in nature with a physical um, treatment or a physical action? Of course, it isn't going to happen. And the logical part of ourselves knows that. We're not, we're not stupid. Um, but it's so compelling. But it doesn't. It doesn't remove the felt sense of shame. So maybe I have the cosmetic surgery on my nose and perhaps it, it does please me, or perhaps after multiple times it pleases me, or it pleases me enough. 
And then I'm there and I'm recognizing, and a lot of this is unconscious. I'm not sitting there and thinking, oh, now I realize my shame is still there. No, I'm having this felt sense of badness of the self and it's still there. So I need to find a new project, a new hope project. I need to now pin it onto something else. So now it's my skin, now it's my hair, now it's my ears. And then I fix that, the felt sense of badness remains, and so I pin it onto something else. And this is, you know, this kind of narrative that BDD moves is, is I believe, where it comes from. Because the underlying sense of shame and not good enoughness and badness remains. And therefore it would make tremendous sense to me that we should be looking at that underlying sense of badness and the underlying sense of shame. Otherwise, we're going to end up in this self-amplifying, repeating cycle where we're constantly pinning our hope onto something new because we're very clever and adaptive like that and we're not just going to give up hope. And then we'll see certain behaviours. So, you know, if the young person is in school, there'll be certain behaviours around education and Amita spoke about that this morning around the avoidance of education, particularly certain lessons, no surprises there, PE and swimming are two that come up all the time. Um, but then also in the work environment as well. You know, often people will talk about um, struggling to get to work on time because their morning routine for getting ready is so lengthy and actually having things like allowing work at work allowing them to come in a bit later does enable them to work actually but having these conversations with employers and with schools can be quite challenging particularly given the shame and you know we know that it's typical that it's between 10 to 15 years that people wait for a diagnosis in the case of or regarding the person first presenting and then finally getting a diagnosis. It's not always that long, but it's, it's the average that is um, often quoted in the research. Why? Well, it's quite difficult to go to the doctor or the GP or even to a family member and say, I, I feel awful about myself and, it, and it's because of my skin. It's, the bit that says it's because of is a smoke screen. The real issue is the felt sense of badness. However, um, as Amita also said this morning, often the response will be something like, well, you're a teenager, all teenagers feel like that. There may be minima minimization, um, which kind of goes on to the next part, um, and a lack of understanding, which causes that person then to shut down and not to talk again about it for many years. So we've got a lot to do in terms of educating and raising awareness. Um, so that this lack of understanding, awareness and support and the attribution of vanity doesn't happen. Because, I mean, you don't need me to say it, of course you don't, that BGC has absolutely nothing to do with vanity, nothing at all. Um, it just happens to be that this felt sense of badness has been projected onto a physical um, element. And this is also couched in a society that extols certain myths. And I think we can only really say this is disordered behaviour if we can also stand here and say that society isn't disordered about appearance. And I don't think we can say that with our hands on our hearts. I really don't. Um, so it's all couched within a wider societal context of the myth of um, looking a certain way is equi um, equitable with lovability, i.e. you will be more lovable if you look more like this is one of the reasons perhaps why we pin that feeling onto the appearance as a potential avenue of hope. Quite possibly, if that wasn't part of the societal narr narrative and discourse, we might be pinning it onto something else. It doesn't make anything better or worse. It just means that we're then called to work with what we've got, but also to recognise, in a sense, that this isn't really about um, the skin, the nose, the hair, the length of the legs, the width of the hips, or whatever it is. This is about this sense of um, the self as, as not good enough and as, as bad in some way. So, this came out in January 2018, the Power Threat Meaning Framework. I put it up there because I think it's worth reading, but also because it takes these wider factors into account. 
And because it asks three questions that I think would be really important to ask when we're thinking about our experience of BDD, but also the experience of those we might be living with and supporting. So it asks, how has power operated in your life? So shame always occurs within a, power, a felt power differential. And there's a lot more we could say about that. I can't believe how fast the time has gone. So how has power operated in your life? What threat did this pose to you? So with shame always comes a threat. So this sense of um, really at the core, the threat of being abandoned and being rejected, that's at the heart of it. And then what meaning did you make of it? And that's really important. So what meaning did you make of that possibility that you might be abandoned or that you might be unlovable? So essentially what we're asking people is what's your story and particularly, what's the story of the BDD part? So, just to think about it in terms of the language of parts, and we all use the language of parts. So I got up this morning, and this isn't a pathology, this is just the normal human condition. And part of me really wanted to come today, and part of me was like, oh, sugar, I'm, you know, I'm quite scared. We've all got different parts of ourselves operating in different ways. And often with BDD, it can feel like the shameful part that's kind of holding the BDD part has become the entire person. We might feel that for ourselves and our, our carers might feel it. And I've definitely had parents say to me, and it breaks my heart, uh, I feel I've lost my child to BDD. I feel it's taken them over completely. And the thing I always say is, you haven't. It might look like that at the moment, it might feel like that at the moment, but you, but you haven't. There is a part of them that is holding this experience of BDD, and there's a part of themselves that you might like to think of as the core self, the true self, the heart, you can think about it as all different ways, that's always there. It's, it's been there from the moment that that person was born and will, will always be there with them, even if it gets hidden under loads of other stuff. And often what we're doing is we're going in and we're desperately trying to pull that part out. So we're trying to get rid of the BDD, demonise it, um, push it into the corner and draw out this part of the person that is aside from it. And what I'm suggesting is, is that actually the shame itself needs to be addressed. That kind of shameful BDD part needs to be addressed. It probably needs to have some time spent with it to understand it. We've probably been... We probably need to be asking curious questions about why it came into the person's life. A question I think is really helpful is, to the BDD, if we want to externalise it for a minute and see it as a part, what problem did you come into such and such's life as a solution for? You know, what, what problem are you a solution for? And if you drill down and drill down and drill down and drill down, in my experience, both the lived and with others struggling is that it comes back to this sense of I'm trying to save myself from being rejected and unlovable and if we can understand it and we can kind of listen with compassion to that part of the person and soothe it and therefore allow it to step aside then the other aspects of that person can come through. So the aspect, actually, that doesn't want to spend five hours a day in front of the mirror and that doesn't want to um, have the cosmetic surgery, the part that wants to live, actually, the part that couldn't care less what the person looked like, that part is always still there, however small it might seem to be. But in order to allow it to emerge, we are now... We, in my personal and humble opinion, need to allow the other aspects to step aside. We need to spend time with understanding the shame and working with the shame. I often think about it visually like, like a, a theatre, and over here there's a whole drama playing out, and the whole drama is around cosmetic surgeons, dentists, dermatologists, mirrors, um, face creams, DIY surgeries at home, all of this, and it's all very dramatic, and it draws the eye, and everyone becomes, can become quite pulled into it, and understandably so, and it's devastating. It's absolutely devastating. And then there's something else going over here, stage left, which is more about this flailing sense of self-esteem, this low self-worth, and this shame. But we're all so busy focused and looking over here. 
And I guess my emphatic plea is to all of us to consider that that shame, whilst it's telling part of our story, and it is, isn't telling the truth of who we are. It might be supporting us to look towards certain experiences so we can move beyond them, but it isn't who we are. And actually, that each of us are good, lovable, and whole, just as we are, without needing to fix or change anything. And again, I speak from personal experience when I say I never thought that would be a possibility. Um, but it is. You can absolutely go from the depths of despair and shame and um, hopelessness to a sense of, I'm good as I am. And the felt sense of badness has told its story and has therefore been able to depart. But expecting it to depart without giving it a chance to tell its story may be challenging. So there is so much more that could possibly be said. Um, any questions? And then I'll just leave this up for further reading in case that's of interest. Um, I didn't put my own thesis up there, but it is available um, on the Essex University um, depos Depository, Depository, I don't know what they call it. Um, so we have about five minutes. Does anyone have any um, reflecting comments, questions, answers? I'm always looking still for answers. And I think somebody's got a mic there. Do you mind, Alana, just roaming around? Hello. Hello, where am I looking? Me. Oh, hello, sorry. Is something you said about um, the shame and the separation, is separation anxiety and shame, can that be linked? And can that sort of, the separation anxiety stop the person developing those edges? I see what you mean. So the question is around this, is sep separation anxiety, because it's part of that struggle to individuate, somehow linked with shame. Yeah. Yeah. And I can see how it can be, although I think it wouldn't necessarily be so. So with separation anxiety, there is this, this f when that struggle comes between autonomy and connection or attachment and detachment, that that's so frightening to that person because they're not quite ready to internalise their ability to self-soothe and to disconnect. And that sh for sure could be due to feelings of shame, so sense that... You know, if, if I'm somehow bad within myself, I still need the other to do that for me. But then it might be for all sorts of other reasons. You know, there may be, have been illness in the family and therefore that, that person is afraid to disconnect because they're afraid if they let the, that person out of their sight, they may become unwell again. Or it could have all sorts of, you know, sort of original organic reasons. But it's an interesting thing to think about. And the aspect of shame being linked to individuation is really important to think about when we think about BDD because then we ask the question, how do I properly individuate actually? How do I find my own edges? How do I find who I am as a person separate? Uh, we'll always be within our culture, our families, our communities, our friendship groups. And yet there's also a sense of self beyond all of that. How do we find that? I think that's a really interesting question. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the good insight between shame and uh, guilt. Uh, I'm a clinician myself, and I have uh, sometimes situations where patients feel they have guilt for the same incidents. Mm. So do you classify that as OCD, or you just think in terms of BDD? It's got nothing to do with can you external us, appearance. Can you give us an example? Just a, uh, say, an for example, example, I have a doctor. She works with her colleagues. She's an FY2 young doctor. And this happened two days ago, actually. Mm. And she came to me. And she feels one of her colleagues is not so responsible. So she had a meeting with everybody in the team. And now it's going to the higher authority. And she came to me and said, do you think that I made a mistake? I feel guilty. I let my colleague down. Mm. And this is not the first time she feels mm. this way. Mm. I think it's a couple of times in the last year. So I don't know whether she needs help or I just have to brush it off. 
Yeah, I mean, it certainly sounds like asking curious questions about that felt sense of guilt might be really supportive and might open up a conversation. I think we are kind of wired to kind of second guess and tri triple guess ourselves because we are wired for social connection. So anything that might cause us to be outside of the group or cause us to upset someone and therefore for that person to reject us, we are going to be naturally very orientated towards. And depending on all sorts of things, the flexibility of our nervous system, so our capacity to deal with difficult emotional states, with how we've kind of learned cognitively to deal with those aspects, we might be able to sort of brush it off and say, actually, it probably wasn't my fault and move on. Um, but if there isn't that flexibility of the nervous system or the sense of that it's possible, we haven't had enough experiences of moving beyond that sense of guilt to know it's possible, we might become stuck in it. Um, and in that case, I think we can all do well as friends and colleagues um, to offer up time to ask questions and listen to those experiences. I don't think it's necessarily a pathology. Um, it's just part of the human condition. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I've got time for one more, I think. Hi. Thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. I just wondered... Um, could, could, you, could you wave? So I, oh, there you Hello. Are. Sorry. Sorry. I just wondered... Um, whether there are treatments out there that are specifically looking at working with the shame and um, facing up to it, mm. as you kind of suggested is often helpful, um, mm. whether you could kind of direct us towards those and yeah. whether the specialist clinics that have spoken to us earlier today focus in on that at all. Yeah, I think um, for sure. So Paul Gilbert spoke at our last conference. Uh, he's the self-compassion guy. So compassion-focused therapy um, is very much looking at that felt sense of shame within the person and developing compassion for all the aspects of the self, including the shameful aspects of the self. And I know that Paul Gilbert's done quite a bit of work with um, Professor Veal, who's one of the leading ex experts in BDD, and, and that's beginning to be brought more and more into BDD treatment. And I think that's a really wonderful start in terms of addressing these underlying um, feelings. Yeah. Thank you. I'll just take, sorry, one more. I know we've gone over a little bit, but we started a little late. I, could I just talk, um, as a sufferer, that I had uh, multiple rounds of CBT. I was uh, diagnosed initially at the Priory, 12 sessions of CBT. I had 12 sessions at the, the specialist clinic at the Maudsley. I had another 12 sessions with private psychologists. For me... I know for a lot of people, CBT does work. Um, it helped me to hang on, kind of hang on to my life, literally mm. by my nails, it felt like. And then I ended up having, um, and I'm a high achiever, I've um, always been very successful in careers, universities. So it wasn't a lack of willpower or trying. But for me, it didn't personally work in, in that I had a full nervous breakdown. I was eight years housebound. Um, uh, sorry, I'm upset. Um, <sighs> Take your time. Sorry. Uh, 40 to 48. Uh, multiple suicide attempts. Luckily, I failed. Uh, the last one, I really put a lot of effort into it. It didn't work. I had... I was just want to say I was very fortunate that um, I, a psychologist two years ago came to me and said, let's try something different with you. You know, you've been through CBT so many times and you are... I was housebound. Um... I literally didn't go out. I would not see people. I went out at night time. This is for eight years. I didn't go to the dentist. Have a, you know, it was a long, very distressing time. Oh, sorry. Um, what I want to say is that having, luckily, I found a psychologist who said, let's try something else. Let's try looking at exactly what you're talking about, the, the parts of yourself. And to me, there were no parts. There was just BDD, the person that used to be high achiever, successful, you know, uh, very sociable, um, all those parts. I just seemed to have gone. I couldn't even go out. I couldn't go for a walk. I never went out in the daylight. And slowly she got to identify, she called it ego state therapy. She also used the um, compassion-based therapy, mindfulness, meditation. And this mixed approach, gradually over a year and a half, it, it's been miraculous for me. Mm. I mean, I've gone from someone who was fully suicidal, repeatedly suicidal for eight years um, to someone now that I don't have, not in treatment at the moment because they said I was no longer eligible because although I still have BDD, basically I've run out of, of sessions, but 
using what I learned, um, we actually held or actually meetings between the parts of myself, and she said, we're going to identify this, the original core bit of you, the strong part, and by bringing that out slowly, slowly, as well as the shame, we had meetings with the shame parts, it, it was quite miraculous for me, and mm. the, the actual, finally, a part of me could come out and start to tackle the BDD, which mm. was very frightening, because the BDD had a voice, I could hear the voice, you know, um, but it worked, and with the self-compassion, over time, and also using meditation, has been literally, I can't describe how amazing it's been mm. to be able to even come here. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I am absolutely certain I speak for all of us when I say I am deeply sorry for what you have experienced and your courage and resilience is blowing me away but also thank you for sharing that that tremendous story of hope with us and it's my deep belief that we can all um, access that part of ourselves that actually knows what to do and actually does still find goodness within ourselves and use that part of ourselves to move beyond our struggles and there's, ne there's never um, any reason to believe there's no hope. So thank you very much. It is lunchtime, so I hope you all have a lovely lunch and a nice rest. So there's a beautiful grounds to explore, and we'll see you back here at ten past one. Thank you. <laughs>